All right, so we're going to talk about gastrointestinal and urologic emergencies. Um, so one of the things we do deal a lot with is the, the abdominal pain. We get that quite often, especially around this area where I'm at. Um, currently, I mean, we do a lot of abdominal pain issues. I have my stomach's bothering, my stomach hurts, and that could be a, an array of different things. So there's so many different things that could be from female reproductive system stuff to um, gastrointestinal, as far as like a gastroenteritis to trauma to any kind of other medical conditions like tumors and things like that there's so many different things that potentially could be in a gastrointestinal type issue or anything in that abdominal area uh, and then we'll talk about some of the ur urologic stuff as well and we'll touch base on some uti stuff and things like that as we move forward this presentation is not super long so it shouldn't take too much to get through as well and just um It works again. Okay, perfect. All right, so um, we're going to cover the assessment of finding findings for the acutely ill patient. We're going to cover pretty heavily in the gastro uh, gastrointestinal disorders, abdominal pain as well, anatomy presentations, and the management of shock associated with abdominal emergencies, gastrointestinal bleeding. How about the upper and lower GI bleeds, things like that. Um, we're going to get more into the acute and chronic gastrointestinal hemorrhages, peritonitis. Um, ulcerative diseases, things like that. Um, and this will play a part too, like the ulcered, like this one here, patients that have active ulcers. So I'll circle that really quick. Um, There's a medication that we administer for cardiac um, that if we have an active bleeding ulcer, it's considered contraindicated to, to administer. What would that be? Aspirin. I'm trying to write down for you in there as well. But yeah, aspirin. Uh, let's see where are we here. Lots of train of thought. Uh, also, some gastro and urinary renal as well. We'll talk about, about renal dialysis, kidney stones, uh, and then urinary catheter management. Not insertion because we do not insert or take those things out. Uh, that's a whole aseptic or sorry, a very aseptic technique that has to be done with that. It's, it's a process to put urinary catheters in place. Um, so those of you who have done them before. They know what I'm talking about. For those who haven't, it's it's it does take some time. It's not something that is actually rushed with, with that because it can cause a lot of damage, especially to the urethra going into the bladder as well. So, all right. So, abdominal pain. It's a very common complaint. Um, I said we get those quite often. It's one of those things that we just can't live around and go around. It's but the problem with the abdominal pain is that you can't see what's going on, right? So that puts our investigation hat on. That's when we start becoming interrogators, trying to figure out exactly what's going on, whether it's sharp, dull, achy, pain, rebound, rigid, ascites. There's so many different things that it potentially could be inside there based upon our questionings, our OPQRST, our sample history, you know, things like that, that we need to really dig deep into finding out truly what's wrong with them. Um, you know, is it diverticulosis, diverticulitis? Uh, there's so many different things that it could potentially be. So... You do not need to determine the exact cause of the abdominal pain, but it's a good idea to find out what's going on, right? Like I said before, I want to get you guys out of that technician world to get you into that clinician, right? Whether you be an EMT to paramedic, doesn't matter what it is, clinician is what we need to be. We need to change that profession that we do. We're no longer a job. We need to be that profession, professionals that we do, uh, that we are. So you should be able to recognize like threatening problems and actively or act swiftly in response to that. Uh, the patient um, in pain is probably anxious, requiring application of your skills, a rapid assessment, and emotional support, and pain management. All right, I understand that people are like, oh, narcotics, this and that, and give them. Not obviously not us as EMTs, but call for pain management. Patients with abdominal pain, it hurts. Control the pain. Right, everybody's like, oh, well, we don't want to use this because well, in the paramedic, I've seen paramedics do the same thing, and they're like, well, I don't want to give this because they're probably just seeking for meds. So how would you know? Well, we were frequent flyers here, and they may have frequent abdominal injuries or abdominal issues, not injuries, but where they require pain management, right? And that reduces that anxiety, that reduces that pain level, and it allows you to be able to do a further assessment without having them having any kind of guarding or things like that. Uh, we're going we're to cover about anatomy and physiology, like the abdominal cavity. We're going to go a little bit more into that in depth here. We start talking about hollow and solid organs. Um, this contains um, the gastrointestinal system. 
the genital system and the urinary system. Right. I mean, like I said before, these are made up of that solid and hollow organs that are there. But again, we'll go more into that here in, in the next slide to this one here. So injury to a solid organ can cause shock and bleeding. If perforation of a hollow organ occurs, the contents will leak out and contaminate the abdominal cavity. Right. What is our most vascular organ that we have? Liver. The liver, right? The liver contains, and I'm drawing a blank, I want to say it's like 60%. I thought it was 20. 20%? I'm drawing a blank on this one here for some reason. It might be 20% well, of our blood volume. I think it's 20. Oh, no. Yeah, 20. push it 23. Yeah, 20%. Yeah, I think sorry about that. I don't know why I said 60. I'm having a moment today. <laughs> yeah, so 20% of our blood volume. That's a lot of blood, right? It's quite a bit. Right. And then you have our, 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 our hollow organs, right? Like our stomach. Right. So what happens if that were to rupture? Right. Septic. Yeah. Sepsis is part of the end result of it. Again, but you're dumping all those contents into the abdominal cavity, into our peritoneum, right? The abdominal cavity is not designed to have that free floating fluid. So, you know, Jen was, uh, yeah, Jen was talking earlier about the ultrasound. That's what we're going to use it for. We're going to do a, we're going to do something called a POCUS, a point of care ultrasound on these patients, and we're going to look for free floating fluid. Air and fluid do not belong in the abdominal cavity. They belong in the, in the, they belong in the organs that they're supporting them. Anything that gets outside of that can cause infection, distension, a lot of other issues with that as well. All right, so breach of these can cause these contaminations to leak. So looking at this slide here, okay. So the solid organs um, of the abdominal cavity. So A are the solid organs. So ovaries, kidneys, liver, right? As you can see, liver, different lobes of the liver here, a lobe like one here. Oh, hold on a minute. That's better. So yeah, we have one lobe here, another lobe down here. All right, that's our liver there. Then we have our pancreas, our spleen. And then our kidneys, ovaries being down here in the female, All right? Where is our liver located, right or left? Right. And how do we palpate that? Gently. <laughs> Gently, I like it, right? But it's going to hurt doing it. So take a deep breath in on the exhalation underneath the rib cage. Remember before during the assessments when I showed you guys how to palpate the liver? What we're feeling yeah. is this right there okay that's at two centimeters of the liver just underneath the rib cage right that's what we're feeling for in a pediatric world if this was inflamed what would that be what would they what would that be indicative of on a pediatric i'm not sure there you go congestive heart failure one of the first signs of congestive heart failure in a pediatric is infl inflammation in the liver. You'll You're talking see that children? In, You're talking pediatric? Pedias, yeah, pediatrics. Okay. Um, what about the spleen? What if that has a laceration then? Where would you, would you, where would you feel pain if you are palpating for the spleen for a splenic injury? Where would the pain be? Can't they have the radiating pain? Ah, yes. To where? The shoulder. Shoulder. The right shoulder. Right, right shoulder. shoulder. I'm I'm sorry. Left shoulder. Okay, left, left shoulder. shoulder. Yeah. Right, the opposite side. So if it's over here, you have pain over here, right? Oh, so it was right. Okay. You also have bruising along here as well for a splenic injury, pancreas injuries, things like that. All right. What is this called? For the bruising there like a hematoma that's another name for it though okay here's the g gray turners oh gray turners that's a t i'm trying my best to draw it with a mouse <laughs> so now referred pain okay so splenic injury, pain, left shoulder. What sign is that called? What is that called? 
Come on, guys. Is it the K? It's not Cushing's, is it? Well, nope. 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 Cushing's would be, well, depending on which Cushing's you're talking about, could be intracranial pressure or yeah, overproduction right. of cortisol. K E H, I think it's H R. Curse sign? Called Curse sign. Right. So if you have a splenic injury with, with referred pain to the left shoulder, it's called Kerr's sign. All right. You guys are going to want to know that. You're going to see that on tests or on your next exam. Uh, but Kerr's sign is referred pain for splenic injury. Okay. And we have our pancreas. Why is this so important? It has all the acids to um, break down foods in the stomach. And also produces the insulin and glucose to keep yeah. our blood sugar in balance. Basically, your endocrine system, right? The stuff that really needs it's important, right? Release of glucose, insulin, sugars, uptakes, things like that. What about your kidneys? What's so important waste. about the kidneys? Removes waste. Yeah. So, <laughs> exactly. So, the liver and the kidneys work hand in hand, right? Mm -hmm. They help with filtration and detoxification, okay? That's why it's so important. It detoxes, and this helps two things. One, it's going to get into our GI tract, and it's going to be pooped out, or it's going to be filtered out through the kidneys, right? Where are the kidneys located? Behind the peritoneum. Give me your actual name for that. Retro um, peritoneum? Yes. Retro peritoneal cavity. For space. So, Kevin, I actually had a question about that. So, the diaphragm. So, the where is the retro peritoneal? It's like a sac, right? Like the retro peritoneal is, is location. So, is it if, you, but what, if you were to, is it a sac? No, it's a pair. It's a cavity. It's a cavity. The, the, peritoneal cavity it was basically here i don't want to circle below, it too much but this is your peritoneal basically it's the stomach <laughs> right yeah. your, your belly if it, was, if it yeah. was broken down so if you had your stomach like this here right your umbilicus is here and it's broken down into four quadrants umbilicus being the center like this okay then you have looking at this one here this is right that's not good there you go right and left right upper quadrant right lower quadrant left upper quadrant left lower quadrant down here umbilical being the center of the cross okay this okay. is your peritoneal cavity so if you want to say retro being behind so if you were asking about your kidney take your hand jason and put it yeah. on your and, and like reach behind and grab your side and go towards your back that's retro peritoneal space and okay. it's below and it's and it's below your diaphragm. So all of these organs are below your diaphragm, correct? Correct. Yeah. The the diaphragm right. being where your lungs and everything else are located in your rib cage, right? And it goes up in an angle. Correct. So your if you were to draw a rib cage on this here. Up here down. Okay. Yeah. This this would be your sternum here, right? Yeah. And then the ribs would then come around like this. And like this, like that. Yeah. Okay. Obviously, multiple ribs going through here all the way up to the clavicle. Yeah, yeah. And they wrap around to the back, right? That's why when you feel the rib cage, you can only palpate a small portion of the liver. But your heart and your lungs, which are all located up here, okay? I wish I had an x-ray to show you, but this is what they call the, the cardiac silhouette. If there's an x-ray, you'd see the heart would be on this side over here, and there'd be a little bit on this side over here like that. You'll see the bronchioles yeah. come... The, the main stem bronchi into the bronchioles, right and left, same, right and left bronchi to the bronchial. This is the trachea bronchi bronchioles in here, like this. A ton of bronchioles, and then little sacs, alveoli, alveolar sacs, right? That's kind of how that works. So it comes down in and it branches down. Your cardiac silhouette is here. Your lungs are here. And they come down on each side like this. I'm doing a horrible drawing. I apologize. It's no, like but, but what I was trying but, to get at was when you say retro peritoneal, I was thinking, like, I kept thinking at first that it was like behind. Yeah, like if I was going to draw a sign, it'd be like this. It'd be like this here and around back. Yeah. 
that's where your kidneys will be located. So when we're doing, we're assessing a patient with kidney stones, we're gonna we're gonna put pressure on that retroperitoneal space in the back. Yeah. Right. Thanks. No, not a problem. I wish I had a better way to draw stuff out. I'm, I'm using a my laptop to do this until I get back to my office down south. So um, a little bit difficult for that. All right. So these are going to be your your solid. Sense, well, I, I can. I... Was that? Um, oh my god, I lost my train of thought here. Hollow organs on this side over here. So your urinary bladder. Okay. Do not say serious at urinary bladder. Um uterus. Large intestines, which kind of go around here. Small intestines are all in the middle. Your stomach is located here. All right. Gallbladder. Ureter. Large intestines, fallopian tubes for a female. Important things to pick up on on this, though, okay, is your stomach. So when you're doing CPR and you're overinflating, what's happening to that stomach? It's getting bigger. It's stretching, right? It's distending. Yeah, it's distending, getting bigger and bigger and bigger, right? What is this right here? What's this up here? Your heart, right? Yeah. Heart's here. When you start inflating this. And it gets bigger and bigger like that inside, right? It's pushing up towards the thoracic diaphragm. cavity in your diaphragm and your thoracic cavity, not allowing for you to be able to compress the heart or heart to pump appropriately while doing CPR. That's why it's so important to control your breath. So I kind of wanted to put this more into perspective. I know this is more abdominal in that AMP, but again, your stomach's part of your abdomen and the overinflation or the extension is right here, okay? And it pushes it. And so if you were to see that in an x-ray, it'd be a big um, air area. Like you'd see a lot of black area there. It'd be this huge black spot on a, on a chest x-ray. So that's kind of how that works while there are going on. So it's very important to understand where these are located. Because as we do our assessments in, in the back of the ambulance or on scene, we're going to be palpating, trying to feel for the large intestines, small intestines, right? We're going to palpate in the area of the stomach. We're definitely going to palpate by the bladder as well and we're going to be palpating the bladder area because of the um, fact of potential urinary retention so you have someone who has impeded like a week significant abdominal pain push on their bladder and then a location there right and then they'll be like oh god it really hurts a lot right in that one spot right and there are ways to do bladder scan but we don't have the abilities here they're mostly done in the er it's like basically a little bit of a ticking type thing that, that kind of vibrates in. It kind of tells you about roughly about how many mLs of urine are in that specific area. All right, so the gastrointestinal system, so responsible for digestion process, right? Uh, digestion begins when the food is put into the mouth and then is chewed, right? What's another name for chewing? Anybody know what that is? Anybody still there? So another, chewing. Chewing. Thank you, no. yeah. another, name, another name for chewing is called mastication. I mastication. couldn't get my thing on. <laughs> yeah, masticating is chewing. All right. Um, I want to so, say that <laughs> so the stomach is also the main organ um, of the digestive system. So gastric juices break down that food, that, that acidic stuff, right? It's breaking down that food to start taking the nutrients out and go where they need to go at that point. The liver assists in digestion as well. It secretes bile and aids in digestion of fats. It also filters toxic substances produced by digestion. And we'll talk more later about the lymphatic system. Um, it also creates glucose stores, very important, right, for energy. Produces substances necessary for blood clotting and immune function. And the gallbladder is a reservoir for, for bile. The small intestines, um, where did I go? There we go. So, food that travels into the small intestines, which consists of three different sections. Okay. One is the duodenum, or digestive juices from the pancreas and liver mixed together. The pancreas then secretes enzymes that break down starches, fats, and proteins. Then you have the jejunum, which plays a major role in absorption and digestion product, digestive products 
and and does much of the work in the small intestines as well. Okay, does most of the work. The ileum absorbs nutrients that were not absorbed earlier and absorbs bile acids so that they can be returned to the liver for future use and vitamin B12 for making nerve cells and red blood cells. So you kind of see how patients, let's put this into perspective now. You've got a patient who's um, 90 years old, hasn't been eating, they're malnutritioned, and they're not doing well. You think this could play a big part? Yes, it could. That's why it's so important to make sure you get your assessments and try to figure out how long it's been, right? Because you need to be able to have that to be able to make red blood cells. And what happens if they're anemic, right? They become anemic. We'll get more to that later on. Um, the colon, which is the large intestines, is where food um, not broken down and then moves into the colon as a waste product. So basically everything that's not broken down, it's not needed. Now we're going to throw that away. It's part of our detoxification process to get rid of that, those toxins. So water is then absorbed in the stool, is now formed, right? So if water is crossing that barrier, what is that called? How does it absorb it? Through what process? It, um... It's a liquid. Diffusion? Diffusion's a gas. Oh, so osmosis? Osmosis, no. yes. Okay. Right? So when you have diarrhea, it's like an overosmotic colon. <laughs> You're taking in too much water. Because the water has to come in, it has to absorb in and create that stool that's there. So we talk about gastrointestinal pain and a patient has, let's say they haven't had a bowel movement. Let's say they have a, a, a bowel obstruction somewhere. What could cause that? Inflammation in your intestines, in your okay, small that'd intestine. Be, that'd be a gastroenteritis. What would cause a bowel obstruction? What would cause that poop to become really hard? Well, lack of, well, dehydration. Yeah, dehydration. What about meds? Could meds do that? Medications? Yes. What specifically? Uh, like a, like an opiate, like a, um. Yeah, keep going with it. You're uh, right. What do they call it? What's the, uh, like if I get in, um. Yeah, people yeah, are chronic pain meds. Yeah. Opi opiates. Big ones also, are opiates. Peristalsis, muscles stop working. That causes a lot of constipation. That too. All right. So you see how a lot of this stuff all ties into your assessment, right? Our job is not to say, oh, God, they have abdominal pain. Let's just transport them to the hospital. Let's try to figure out why. It's, it's you know, this is medicine, right? What can we do to help them? All right. We do not do any kind of digit, digit impactations or whatever at all. Okay, so please do not stick any fingers up there. All right, that's for the doctors <laughs> to do. I've seen that done before. I've seen doctors go full hand in, pulling stuff out. Not the greatest so at we all. Can't, we can't rub their stomach to the right or whatever way my wife tells me. <laughs> One way you can rub your stomach gets the... The patient may think you're kind of weird rubbing their stomach, but uh, <laughs> we'll talk about counterclockwise uterine wall massages later, but... We'll get that during obstetrics. Uh, so the male reproductive system. So the genital system. So the abdominal space also holds reproductive organs like male. So testicles, epididymis, um, bursa, differentia, seminal vesicles, prostate gland, penis. Those are all part of the male. Female, vagina, cervix, uterus, lopian tube ovaries. All right. Sure, we pretty much know all about those there. Again, having an idea, though. Now, we're going to get into, when we get into gynecological emergencies, we'll talk more into the female stuff and male stuff as well. I'm not going to hit it hard now because that's just not where we need to be. Um, so we get into gynecological, we'll talk about like PID, you know, things like that. Uh, the urinary system controls discharge of waste materials filtered uh, from the blood by the kidneys, okay? So the kidneys are a solid organ, and there are two kidneys, one for each side of the body, okay? So what's very important within those kidneys?
All right. So we have our kidneys. Filtration. Uh, right. So we have our blood. kidneys here, right? Inside the kidneys, you have little triangles. Yeah. Okay. So that's a horrible triangle. I'm sorry. Right. Those triangles are called nephrons. Mm -hmm. Okay. Inside the nephron, there's, I'm going to do, there's a glomerus, which looks something like this. I'm, I'm horrible at drawing, by the way. I can't even draw a stick <laughs> figure correctly. All right. And then you have, so you have a loop. You have one, a loop that goes up and then back down again, right? So we have an ascending and descending loop inside the kidney, right? That helps with that filtration. The glomerus, okay, is a is part of your filtration here as well. So I'm going to give you something a little bit more than EMT level, okay? So I'm going to let you guys know this stuff here. This glomerulus is something that what they call, and if you guys have ever been in a hospital before, it's called a GFR. Okay, it's called a filtration rate. And, what, and this is part of lab work. It's kind of above and beyond what you guys need to know, but it's kind of interesting how they measure it. And what they'll do is they'll they'll take some of your blood work and they'll take two different blood works. Uh, one's called a BUN, one's called a creatinine. And they'll come up with a number that'll be your GFR. And then the GFR, as long as it's greater than 60, it's normal. And if it goes below that and start getting down lower and lower and lower, that means they can't filter correctly, okay? So if they tell you as an EMT, well, I my my kidneys don't filter well. They they say I had a GFR of like twenty five. They're not going to get any contrast time. They can't filter. Their kidneys are shot. They're probably on dialysis. Okay. Again, I'm not going to get into, into lab numbers with you. It's not it's, it's not what it's about, right? I mentioned about the ascending and descending loop. Okay. What is a medication that people can take that helps people pee more? Lasix. Lasix. Okay, Lasix, right? You guys all heard of that before? Borosamide, yeah. Borosamide? Lasix is a loop diuretic, which stimulates the ascending and descending loop in the nephron in the kidney, causing urination, okay? So patients that take Lasix. What is the drawback with Lasix? I'm going to tell you what it is. It's a non oh my God, a non-potassium sparing diuretic which means that you're going to piss out all your potassium and you're not replenishing it. What does your heart need to run? Potassium. potassium. That needs potassium and sodium, right? There's something called the sodium potassium pump. Did, did Morgan talk about that with you guys in, in cardiac? I don't know if he did or not. No. Okay. Well, in order for your heart to have electrical charge, you have to have positive and negatives, right? That's sodium, potassium moving around in the pump with, with, with um, magnesium as well and things like that. We're not going to get into detail on how that works. That's You take my advanced class, we're going to go in detail on all of that. All right. But you need to have potassium. So if a patient is peeing it all out, right, their electrolytes are going to be off. They're going to have cardiac arrhythmias. So when they say my chest hurts, that's what's probably going to happen, right? So kind of a little off topic, but not. The bladder is located behind the pubic synthesis, and the bladder empties urine outside the body through the urethra, about one and a half to two liters of urine per day. So the average adult puts out how much an hour? Thirty. Thirty mLs per hour. Okay, that's the average adult urine output. It's about thirty mLs an hour. All right, so this figure here shows the urinary system. So like I've been said before, we have our, our, our kidneys, our nephrons inside, we start peeing stuff out, okay? They go down the ureters into the bladder, all right? This is where the bladder holds all the pee. Your prostate glands here, obviously the penile shaft here, all right? And this is the urethra coming straight down through the opening, all right? So this is kind of the important part to pay attention. If a patient has kidney stones up here, they're trying to pass through there to come down. If the stone is too big, it bounces off that ureter, causing significant inflammation, okay? And the inflammation is causing that significant pain, all right? Now, bladder infections, 
okay, not kidney. It can work its way up. Bladder infections here. UTIs, urinary tract. Males have a longer urethra than females do, correct? That's why females are more prone to UTIs than males are. However, males still get them, patients that catheterize. So if you take a Foley catheter and they sell cath at home, let's say this is the catheter I'm drawing in, okay? It comes out here, right? Little bag, we'll set the bags out here somewhere here, right? And then it comes in here, it's tied off to the leg, goes through the tip, deep inside here, into the bladder. And then there's a bulb that fills up with air right here, like this, so it can't pull back through. It can if you pull hard enough. That causes significant damage, okay? All right? If they keep taking this out and putting it back in and they don't do aseptic technique, that's going to cause a bladder infection, which eventually can work its way up the ureter into the kidneys, all right? Causing significant kidney infections as well. But we see a lot of this in these patients where they have that bladder or the um, urinary tract here infection. Does that make a little more sense than I just, since I described it? how that works, right? So if a patient becomes septic from this, it's called urosepsis, okay? Uro being urology, right? In the urinary system. All right, so any questions on the urinary system at all? Starts in the kidneys, comes down to ureters, into the bladder, right? Passes through the prostate gland, through the urethra, down the shaft, out, and into the world. Any questions on the male urinary system? All good? Very important. Right? Also, another one too is uncircumcised males have, are more prone to urinary tract infections because they don't pull the skin back to clean. So we see a lot of that too. All right, so the abdominal cavity is lined with the peritoneum. We talked about the peritoneal cavity. The peritoneal, the, the parietal peritoneum lines the walls of the abdominal cavity. The visceral peritoneum covers the organs, right? We talk about visceral fluids being inside the abdomen, right? So foreign materials such as blood, pus, or bile can irritate the peritoneum causing peritonitis, right? Itis meaning inflammation, okay? So we wanna make sure everything stays there. So the presence of those, so those different fluids causes that pain, that peritonitis, that inflammation that we're having there. These patients are going to need antibiotics to get this to be relieved, right? I'm not going to get into the details of antibiotics. They're going to need to go to the hospital for antibiotic therapy, right? So the acute abdomen is not a pretty abdomen, right? <laughs> refers to a sudden onset of abdominal pain. That's something that's been a chronic going on for long periods of time, but that acute pain that hits you all of a sudden, right? Often associated with severe progressive problems. These require medical attention. Peritonitis is inflammation of the peritoneum, which typically lies in the ileus, right? The ileus, um, or like a paralysis of the muscular contractions, retain gas and feces cause distension, and stomach empties by emesis, right? So we are retaining all that stuff that stomach tries to empty. Diverticulitis is an inflammation of the small pockets at the weak areas of the muscle walls, right? So you'll have like the muscle walls being here, okay? And you'll have little pockets like this inside, right? Cholecystitis is an inflammation of the gallbladder, right? You're gonna need to know these names, right? So you have inflammation of the diverticulum, diverticulitis, right? Cholecystitis is an inflammation of the gallbladder, and acute appendicitis is our inflammation of the appendix. Where is the appendix located? In the right lower right. right. Lower right. And what is the name of that point that's it's called the located? Yeah. Um, Use it with an M. Come on. I don't know. Okay, it's fine. McBurney's point. McBurney's point. So if you have. You feel part of the. Right, we're on slide right, 24. And then you go right. over. All right, so we're on slide 24. Let me go out to here for a minute. Okay. So your appendix being located on the 
right side. So down here, right? Right. Or, 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 or there right somewhere. There. Okay. What you want to do is you want to measure from the umbilicus three quarters of the way down into your groin, your pelvis. And that's going to be the Kevin, location. Kevin, are you talking? I can't hear anything. I can hear. You guys can hear me fine? I can, I can yeah. hear you. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you fine. All right. Kim, can you hear me now? Not Kim. Um, Tina, sorry. Cool. Tina? <laughs> Tina, can you hear any of us? We can hear you, Tina. Not now. Uh oh. She's got oh. She got Oh, crap. All right. So, McBurney's point. So, if you find your umbilicus and you go three quarters of the way down towards your pelvis, okay, on that diagonal axis. That's there. That's where your appendix is going to be located. And what we do is we want to actually palpate that. And we want to push down on it on a patient that may have appendicitis. You have rebound tenderness and pain with a fever. It's probably appendicitis. Okay. The appendix, if it bursts open, all those fluids inside that get into the peritoneal cavity causing significant sepsis. Okay. She's not trying to get back on, is she? I'm back. I lost you guys. Oh, hi. <laughs> We're talking about McBurney's point and okay. appendicitis. Okay. Thank you. All right. We're about to slide 24 now, 25 now. So abdominal pain, uh, there's two different types of nerves that supply the peritoneum. The par uh, parietal peritoneum is supplied by the same nerve that supplies the skin of the abdomen. This can easily, uh, can easily identify and localize a point of irritation. With it. So visceral peritoneum is supplied by the autonomic nervous system. Okay. What two parts? Are, what what two parts are there for the autonomic nervous system again? Sympathetic and parasympathetic. Yes. So when you have the abdominal stuff, you start talking about the feed or breed stuff. Which which autonomic nervous system are we talking about? Sympathetic. It's parasympathetic. Okay. Right. That's our feeder breed. Sympathetic is our fight or flight. Right. So the parasympathetic nervous system, which the neurotransmitter for that is acetylcholine, um, it helps lower things down. Right. Your heart rate comes down. You start relaxing. That allows our bowels to function and things like that. If your sympathetic nervous system takes over, right, creating norepinephrine as a neurotransmitter and epinephrine as a hormone and things like that, then our our G, our GI tract shuts down. Then we don't want the poop anymore because <laughs> our system's taking over. But our parasympathetic system allows us to do our business. <laughs> Looking at it that way. All right. So the nerve, um, the nerves less are less able to identify and localize pain. Referred pain results from the connection between the body's two separate nervous systems, like Kerr's sign with a splenic injury. So some common causes of acute abdominal injury are pain. Ulcers, protective layers of the mucose linings, starts to erode, allowing acid to eat at the, into the organ. Some common causes of the most peptic ulcers are caused by an infection of the stomach with the um, heliobacter pylori bacteria. Okay. You guys got all that? Heliobacter pylori bacteria? Like, sure. <laughs> You guys got this, right? All right. Most people so, call it H. pylori, so you is. might have heard that. Yes. The heliobacter, they usually don't pronounce. This H. pylori is correct. H. pylori bacteria, right? So chronic use of anti-inflammatory drugs like NSAIDs. Um, my dog was cold. I'm outside, sitting outdoors right now. My dog looks like he's shivering. Um. The chronic use of anti-inflammatory meds, uh, signs and symptoms would be gnawing pain in the stomach, uh, nausea, vomiting, belching, and heartburn, and complications like hematemesis, so vomiting blood, melena, so dark-colored stools or peritonitis, inflammation in the peritoneum. Gallstones may form as well and block the outlet of the gallbladder. 
if the blockage is not relieved, inflammation in the gallbladder or cholecystitis can occur. Some signs and symptoms would be constant severe pain in the right upper or mid-abdominal region that may refer to the right upper back shoulder area or flank. Nausea, vomiting, ingestion, bloating, gas, and belching as well. Yeah, and when this is inflamed, you know it. Have you had it happen before? I actually had to have mine removed. Your gallbladder? Um, but yes, it was, I, my gallbladder was full of stones and I couldn't pass the stones and I was like begging. I was like, this is the way I'm going to die. It was so painful. And yet it's so small. <laughs> <laughs> I know and then it was even worse when the surgeon like pushed on it was like does it hurt here and you just like see stars you want to punch the surgeon in the face oh so. my god <laughs> so yeah not not good all right so that's a cholecystitis uh pancreatitis uh some common cause are obstructing gallstone alcohol abuse and your signs and symptoms are going to be severe pain in the right my goodness in the upper left and right quadrants that can radiate to the back. Sorry, my daughter just came outside to get the dog of this freezer. All right, so um, nausea, vomiting, abdominal distension, and tenderness. And complications would be sepsis or hemorrhage, right? If you have a bleed somewhere or they become septic. And like I said, we, we already covered septic shock already, correct? Morgan covered all that. I think that was the night Morgan and I tag teamed back and forth. Um, but sepsis is is a killer. It's one of the number one killers, right? Usually secondary to like pneumonia or something else that's going on. Appendicitis is an inflammation or infection in, in the appendix. So usually it's a uh, initial pain that is generalized like a dull and diffuse, which may center in the umbilical area. The pain then localizes to the right lower quadrant and may have some referred pain as well. Uh, so and normally it's referred to the opposite side. They can do that as well. Um, may have some nausea, vomiting, uh, anorexia, fever, and chills. Rebound tenderness. Like I said, you got to use two pink, two hands, and palpate over the appendix. Some complications would be abscess, shock, like septic shock, peritonitis. Sorry, I just got a text from the chief. Um, gastrointestinal hemorrhage is so a symptoms of another disease as well, not a disease itself, or maybe acute or, or chronic. So again, you have to really investigate and act and ask the right um, questions. So esophagitis occurs in the lining of the esophagus becomes inflamed or infected from, or acids from the stomach. So gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD. All right. Um, we'll have that. So what medication would you pick up on if if a patient had GERD? Prilosec. Like Prilosec or Prilosec yep. or Promethazine. Another one is Aliparinol as well. Not Aliparinol. That's for gout. My goodness. I'm having, a, I'm having, I'm having a night tonight. One of those nights. Aliparinol is for gout. I corrected myself pretty quickly on that one there. Yeah, Prilosec and all those as well for GERD. Um, pain with swallowing and feeling like there is something stuck in his or her throat, heartburn, nausea, vomiting, sores in the mouth, and then esophageal varices. Okay. That is nasty. All right. I've, I've seen, I've had cardiac arrest for patients that had varices ruptures. And it looks like a bloodbath, like someone got murdered in a home. All right. So yeah, not a press. Yes. Yesterday, I did my first with um, Northeast, and it was supposed to just be a transfer for a man on blood products. And he ended up, he was on our stretcher, and he bled from every orifice before we they could get him. It was, he was med flighted out, but I had never seen anything. I mean, it looked like a movie, like literally. Was it esophageal varices that caused yeah. the bleed? Yeah. Well, they had him on blood products, and then they ruptured. And... Oh. We were just doing a transfer to main med. They thought he was stable enough to go. And we had literally just put him on our stretcher. And then, so he was out of their system and onto our system. He was our patient. Yep. And literally, I'm obviously I wasn't working on him because I was there training and driving. But um, the paramedic and the EMT that I was working with, they were freaking amazing because for like two minutes, 
those nurses and doctors, they had to get him back into the computer system in order to work back on him. It was, but the med flight was there within five minutes because they were in Sanford. Yep. I, it, it was, I, I've just never seen anything like it. It was. Yep. The blood uh, vessels surrounding the esophagus. Yeah. It just, it just rupture and it looks yeah. like a blood bath. I mean, it came out as eye, like it trickled out the side. It yep. was just, yeah. So it frequently a result of liver failure for these as well, to kind of add to that. And a lot of times you're chronic alcoholics. Yeah. Okay. I have this. Common cause of alcohol or um, industrialized in countries. Um, viral hepatitis in developing countries as well. And with the gradual disease process, patients will initially um, start showing signs of liver disease. So you'd see what again if your liver fails? Color will your skin change to? Jaundice. Yeah, jaundice yellow, right? You'll start to see it on the sclera of the eyes as well. The white will start turning um, yellow as well. Rupture of varices is far more sudden. So the signs and symptoms, sudden onset of discomfort in the esophageic region, or ep epigastric region, or sternum, uh, difficulty swallowing, vomiting, or bright red blood. Remember, that's your vessels rupturing. Hypotension and signs of shock because you have so much blood loss for these patients. Mallory Wise syndrome is a junction between the esophagus and the stomach where it tears. That's called Mallory Wise syndrome. You'll see that again. Common causes would be violent coughing or vomiting. Uh, signs and symptoms would be signs of shock, upper abdominal pain, hematemesis, and melena. Gastroenteritis is an infection combined with diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting. It can also be, um, be caused by a non-infectious condition as well. So signs and symptoms would be diarrhea uh, with blood and or pus, abdominal cramping, nausea, vomiting, fever, and anorexia, and dehydration and shock are some of the complications with that as well. Diverticulitis is the lack of fiber in the diet causes consistency of stools becoming more solid, requiring more intestinal contractions and increasing pressure in the colon. All right, the bulges in the colonic walls um, from increased intestinal contractions as well. So the fecal matter then becomes caught in those bulges. Remember how I showed you before? Where it starts bulging the walls like this here, and you start seeing them. I drew them inward, but I meant outward like this here. Instead of the wall of the colon, it starts trapping inside, right? Um, and this is where that inflammation starts happening, right? What type of muscle is our colon? Smooth. Smooth. Smooth muscles, right? So perforation of the intestinal walls leading to severe infection and shock. Patients that have diverticulitis can go into shock very quickly. They also have nasty infections. Um, hemorrhoids created by swelling and inflammation um, of blood, um, blood vessels surrounding the rectum as well. And hemorrhoids can be caused by distress as well. So common causes, conditions, and increased pressure of the rectum, irritation of the rectum, signs and symptoms be painless, bright red bleeding during defecation. All right, what time is it? So it is seven o'clock. Um, let's just take 10 minutes. We'll come right back.
Uh, give about another minute here. We'll get started back up. So, hey, I got a question. Uh, I was doing the, um, what do you call those things? The assessments and actions. Yeah. For this, uh, for this chapter. And I got to question four. And I think there's a typo in the answers. Do you guys all agree with me? There probably is. I thought it was, the, the question was, you suspect upper, what's that? I'm just trying to figure out which one, which chapter, 17? I mean, oh, 19? Yeah, chapter 19. Yeah, the one that we're doing okay. right now. So the question is, you suspect upper gastrointestinal bleeding. All of the following fit this category, except esophageal varices, hemorrhoids, esophagitis, and Mallory Weiss tear. I thought it was B, hemorrhoids. I scroll down to the answer. It's It says B, ulcers, ulcerative chloritis. Cl cl I'm sorry. Colitis. 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 It's not even on there, but I still think it's B. I think it's it B does, and the ulcerative Hemorrhoids is a lower. Colitis. Hemorrhoids is lower GI. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I thought. So that's a typo. Yep. So I get it right. But my second question is, I could not find in this chapter, it says, um, we suspect that it's uh, esophageal varices. And it says appropriate management for this patient would be fast. <laughs> high flow oxygen, oral glucose. I know that one ain't it. Activated charcoal. I know that ain't it. Nope. And placing the placing patient in supine, uh, placing the, the patient in supine. supine. So that's the answer. No. <laughs> well, that's Women the answer. Them supine, they choke. That's the answer. Yeah, that's not even right either. So I mean, oxygen, yes, because they're bleeding out. Yeah. But but really, it's going to be if their esophageal varices rupture, and they're bleeding everywhere, you're going to be suctioning. You're going to be committed to suctioning for a long time. Unless they can maintain their own airway, but you're not going to lay them. They laid the dew down yesterday. Is, are you guys this one? Is your number six in your book that way, that wrong too? That, that, uh, I'd have to look. I haven't looked at the assessment. All right. The chapter yet. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, if you're finding these errors, do me a favor. This is the and first chapter I found those. Well, if you find errors, anybody, any one of you, find errors on the assessment and action stuff, or if you see an error in the presentation or whatever, just shoot me an email and I'll send it right to AOS and tell them to fix it. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's talk about cystitis or bladder infections. Um, so these are, these are common, also known as a UTI. So common causes would be bacterial infection, uh, signs and symptoms would be midline lower abdominal pain, blood in the urine, and urgency or frequency in urination. And I'm not talking about a diabetic, right? Excessive urination. But you'll see frequent urination, uh, pressure or pain around the bladder, and complications of a kidney infection with that as well. So if it travels up into the uterus into the kidney. Um, urosepsis is dangerous. It can kill people. Okay? It has to be treated. It needs to go to, they need to go to a doctor's. So they need to go to the hospital, ER. They're going to get antibiotics, and they're going to move from there. They'll also do some culture testing and then and urine samples and everything else. Well, your analysis to see about blood and whatnot. I don't know. So I was just going to ask how you would do high flow oxygen and suction at the same time. Because the dude yesterday, they supined him and they suctioned. Yeah, so supine, appropriate management for this patient would be placing the patient in supine. So right, but he said no. He said high flow oxygen, I'm and I'm just wondering I'm how you would do high flow oxygen yeah, and suction. Yeah. I mean, they they like flipped him down quick. Hmm. So he was sitting 45. Yeah, he was for and... for yeah for comfort. There you go. I was muted. I don't know why what happened again. Um, <laughs> so I, I apologize. 
So the answer to your question, supining is not wrong, but you've got to maintain the airway. Right. The they they were going, suctioning. The reason why they're supine is you're distributing the load over the system because of the significant blood loss. You can't sit them up. Yeah. Right. So that's why we lay them down flat. But you also have to continuously suction, but they're going to need oxygen as well. And they're also going to need blood products and a bunch of other stuff too. It's not just one answer to that. So I don't, I'm not a big fan of that question. Hmm. But I guess if you had to choose, supining is probably the right answer. All right. Did you guys hear me talking about um, the urinary system? Nope. Uh, no. Okay, so I went over the whole entire thing. Apparently, I was muted. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> cystitis or the bladder infection is very common, right? So the UTIs caused by a bacterial infection, and signs and symptoms would be mi midline lower abdominal pain, blood in the urine, and urgency to and frequency in urination, and pressure and pain around the bladder. The complications would be kidney infections. Keep in mind that UTIs can turn uroseptic. Urosepsis can kill people, right? So just because they have bladder problems, that they have a fever and chills, it might not be a pneumonia. It might not be that type of sepsis, right? Ask the question, have you had frequent urination? Have you had any issues, burning sensations when you pee, any groin pain, you know, things like that. Try to get down to that, that road of, is it a UTI or not? Do you self-cath at home? Right? No, those kind of questions there. Kidneys play a major role in maintaining homeostasis. I think I hit that pretty hard already today. Um, so when kidneys fail, uremia results. So kidney stones can grow over time and cause blockage. Kidney stones are basically an abundance of calcium buildup inside the kidneys, causing significant inflammation and pain trying to bust through a ureter. Normally what they do is they send you to the hospital. The best medication for this is Toradol. Right, it's an, it's an anti-inflammatory. It works great for renal colic, right? But not just tort, I'll follow it up with some Dilaudid, something like that, something some stronger hitter at the hospital. What they're gonna try to do is get you to pee it out, okay? They'll do some tests, they'll do, they'll do a, a CTA of the, of the kidneys, they'll inject some dye into it, see what's going on and find out what's going on with that. Then they'll give you a screen and a little cup to send home with, and you're gonna pee into a screen until the stone passes, right? If it's too big to pass, then they're going to send you in for surgery and they'll break it up. All right? Please don't go around punching somebody's kidney trying to break up their stones for them. This is probably not going to work. They're probably going to punch you back. All right? Little, little stones can literally drop a bodybuilder that benches 500 pounds. Okay? This significant, significant pain. They don't do, like, ultrasonic stuff? They, they can. Okay. They can do that, too. They can do ultrasonic. They can go in and retrieve it. There's a lot of things that can happen with this, but again, it's all surgical intervention stuff that I'm not super familiar with. Um, the acute kidney failure, so sudden decrease in kidney function and reversible with prompt diagnos diagnosis and treatment. Again, there are a lot of things that can cause kidney failure, one of them being sepsis, right? Multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, MODS, M-O-D-S, is a result of severe sepsis or septic shock, right? Chronic kidney failure is irreversible. Progressive, um, some common causes of progressive and irreversible damage would be diabetes or hypertension. Some signs and symptoms would be lethargy, nausea, headache, cramps, edema in the extremities and face, seizures, and coma. This will eventually require treatment with dialysis. These patients have an increased risk of heart failure and cardiac arrest as well. Right. Some of the common causes of the um, acute kidney failure are dehydration, sepsis, heart failure, medications, drug abuse, kidney stones, hemorrhage, trauma, shock, things like that. Uh, female reproductive organs, gynecologic problems are a common cause of acute abdominal pain. So lower quadrant pain may relate to either the ovaries, fallopian tubes, or uterus. Um, so, again, in Chapter 23, in gynecologic emergencies, this will cover gynecologic emergencies more in depth. I'm not going to get into it more here. But any female in childbearing years who's currently sexually active potentially have a ectopic pregnancy. And where is that ectopic pregnancy normally located? Any thoughts? Fallopian tubes? Yeah, the fallopian tubes, most commonplace. 
All right. So other organ systems, the aorta, the aorta being your major blood supply, right? Across from 11 so road. the aorta lies immediately behind the peritoneum. Weak areas can result in abdominal aortic aneurysm, a triple A. Abdominal aortic, you give that triple A, is very difficult to detect. Okay, it's a back pain with a tearing sensation. So use extreme caution when trying to assess or detect the triple A. If the aneurysm tears or ruptures, massive hemorrhage may occur. They bleed out, and they have like a 10% chance of survival even on the operating table if they have a if they have a aortic aneurysm that tears. Okay. The aorta is about the size of a quarter in diameter. It's your major blood supply to the body. It comes off the ventricle, right? The right or left ventricle, right or left. Right. The right ventricle pumps in through the pulmonary artery, which which is the oxygenated blood. It goes into the lungs, comes back through the pulmonary vein, which is oxygenated blood. It goes into left. the left atria through the Mitral valve into the left ventricle, into the aortic valve, into the aorta. All right. I had, this a, I, had a, I had a guy in my National Guard unit had this happen to him after a PT test. We were running and we all took showers and this happened to him. It was pretty quick. He died. Yep. It's really fast. Very fast. So is, you guys, is this more is this more common with people that have like the bilateral um, amputation lower? I'm not sure. I know it happens it, in car accidents, AR dissections, and and things like that. But there's different types of aneurysms. There's a type one through type four. Um, we're not going to get into detail with those here. Not in this class. You take the advanced class, you'll go more in detail on those and more anatomy. But um, you guys see how I just recited the drop of blood? You guys have to know that, by the way. Where deoxygenated and oxygenated blood come from and goes? Maybe you could repeat that and send it to us. Maybe I could just, yeah, I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So then we could like have your voice and we could just copy, you yes. know, like... So it's you know, I, you know, I remembered it. I have to, I have to remember things by things in my life. And for me, I remembered the blood returns to the heart in the upper right because for me, I boat a lot and I teach a lot of boating classes. And when you're coming in from the ocean upstream of any river in the United States, when you're traveling inland, you're going, you're returning from the ocean, and it's red right return. So all the buoys that are on your right as you're returning from the ocean are red. So I just remembered that red, right return. So now that sticks in my mind. Yep. Returning blood is in the upper right. And then it goes to the lower. It's also. Then it goes, then it goes to your, your, uh, it goes to get, you know, uh, oxygen. And then it comes back to your left and then it returns. That's how I remembered it. But, but anyway. remember, that's, that's not a bad way to remember it. You also remember though, that you have deoxygenated blood coming in the return oxygenated blood going out right so blood comes in deoxygenated blood comes in through the superior and inferior vena cava okay into the right atrium it goes to the right atrium in through the tricuspid valve yep yeah. goes into the right ventricle which then goes through the pulmonic valve right into the pulmonary artery which is a deoxygenated blood in an artery that then goes into the lungs. In the lungs, oxygen comes in, all right, picks up on the red blood cells and all that kind of fun stuff at the alveolar level, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where the pulmonary artery into the lungs, lungs then get rid of carbon dioxide. As it goes through, it then pumps through, right, through the pulmonary vein, which is now oxygenated blood into the Left. left left atrium, atrium. right atrium. Yeah. right through the mitral valve into the left ventricle through the aortic valve into the ascending into the uh, sorry into the aorta aortic. so it goes right so basically it starts in the descending aorta or ascending aorta into the aortic arch into the descending aorta out into the body okay 
Now, off that aorta, there's different vessels that come off, right? Subclavian, things like that. All these different arteries that come off the aorta that you guys really don't need to know about. At least not right now. Okay? That's the drop of blood. And you have to have that memorized. Because that's going to mean so much on, on any patient you're dealing with with cardiac events. Okay? Very important to know where blood goes and comes from. Um, who's old enough in the class? Remember the TV show Happy Days? That would be me. I, w I was young, but I remember it. Me too. Google search drop of blood happy days. No idea what it. you're talking about. <laughs> you youngin. <laughs> if you Google search. I've seen every episode when it was aired. Was, I've seen every episode of MASH. So not, not happy. Well, if you saw every episode of happy run. days, you remember when Arthur Fonzarelli came in. And hey. it was sticking up and sticking up for, um, was it mouth? I think it was the, yeah. Yeah. And mouth, mouth. Yes. Yeah, and, Ralph he's saying, mouth. And, he, and he's saying the song, The Drop of Blood. That's how he memorized The Drop of Blood. He turned it into a, a song. And I never forget it because I saw that episode. And it was like, yes, this is awesome. So Can you sing it to us? I Happy will not. Days, pump your blood. Pump your blood. That's it. But it is. Yeah. Watch it another time. We're gonna keep on with this with this presentation, but <laughs> it's actually pretty good though. All right, you'll never forget it again. <laughs> All right. So hernias are um, a protrusion of an organ. Protrusion. I can't speak today. Blah. Protrusion of an organ or tissue through a hole or opening in the body, in the body cavity where it does not belong. If you see a hernia, please do not push it back in. Okay, let the hospital take care of that. Um, common causes would be congenital defects, a surgical wound that has failed to heal, a natural weakness in the area such as the groin. Hernias may not always produce in a noticeable mass or, excuse me, or a lump. So hernia, hernias, um, so reducible hernias pose little risk and can be pushed back into the body cavity. The patient may do it on their own. We're not pushing hernias back in. Let the doctors handle that. Um, incarcerated hernias um, cannot be pushed back into the. Sorry, but back into the body cavity. Again, I can't speak today. Cannot be pushed back in and are compressed by the surrounding body tissue. So strangulation of an incarcerated hernia is a serious medical condition. So blood supply is compromised by the compressed surrounding tissue. So these may have to be surgically repaired. Serious hernia signs and symptoms are, are a formerly reducible mass that is no longer reducible. Pain at the hernia site. Tenderness where, um, when the hernia is palpated. Or red or blue skin discoloration over the hernia. I remember I went to a guy in, in, in Massachusetts on a call, and he had so many hernias. Oh my God! And some of them were discolored and like just looked like they were dead, ready to fall off. He lived on the he lived on the railroad tracks. It was horrible. Um, so patient assessment, scene size up. We're almost done with this chapter here. So scene safety, BSI, mechanism of injury, acute abdomen can be the result of violence such as blunt or penetrating trauma. And use assessment results to develop an early index of suspicion for life threats. So again, head to toe assessment. Um, and then do more of your focus if it's an abdominal thing. So primary assessment, the first priority is to identify life and treat life-threatening conditions, form a general impression, airway breathing, circulation, pulse rate, skin quality, temperature. But the thing you want to ask about the bleeding, though, is ask about the patient um, if they have any vomit, any blood in the vomit, or black tarry stools, like that melena, that black tarry stool, or blood vomiting, vomiting blood. Um, and if they say yes and they still have it in the toilet, go look at it. Okay, you get a good justification of, or area of how much blood they've actually lost. Check pulses in both feet. So a difference in pulse strength may indicate an aortic um, dissection. All right, transport decision. Immediate transport is warranted if there are signs and symptoms of significant illness. Let's grab our sample history. All right, nausea, vomiting, changes in bowel habits, urination, weight loss, belching, flagellants, um, pain, other signs and symptoms you may come across, concurrent chest pain. You know, things like that. So you want to ask those sample history questions as well. We're going to get our secondary assessment by palpating the abdomen. As you can see here, all four quadrants, two hands, you have to be touchy-feely as an EMT. You have to touch your patient. 
right? Pain and tenderness are the most common symptoms of an acute abdominal, acute abdomen. Localized pain may give you clues of the problem organ. Okay, if it's not just diffused throughout the entire abdomen, if it's more pinpointed, that helps us out, right? And kind of an idea of what's going on. Muscles in the abdominal walls may become rigid, involuntary, and that's what we call guarding. Okay, you'll probably see that again. Um, a high respiratory rate with normal pulse and pulse rate and blood pressure may indicate improper ventilations, right? A high respiratory rate and, and pulse rate with signs of shock may indicate sepsis or hypovolemic shock. If a patient is has dialysis shunts in his or her arm, avoid taking blood pressures in the same arm as a shunt to avoid damaging it. Another name for that would be called a fistula. Okay. We do not take blood pressures over fistulas. Do not, do not, do not. Reassess. Because it is often difficult to determine the cause of abdominal pain, frequent reassessment is important. Right? You're going to assess interventions, including uh, treatment for shock and providing emotional support. Transport the most comfortable position for the patient. Consider ALS and communicate and document. Right? As far as other medical care, you cannot tr treat causes of acute abdominal pain. Take the steps to provide comfort and lessen effects of shock. Right? Position the patient who are vomiting to maintain a patent airway, so left lateral recumbent. Right? Contain a vomitus or uh, contain the vomitus to prevent spread of infection. So biohazard bags or gloves, eye protection, wash your hands. Please wash your hands. Um, provide low flow oxygen may also decrease nausea and anxiety as well. If you're in New Hampshire, you can have them sniff an alcohol prep within your protocol as an EMT, and that helps relieve nausea. Um, dialysis emergencies in patients with end-stage renal disease or chronic renal failure. Uh, dialysis is the only definitive treatment. Um, dialysis filters the blood, cleans out the toxins, returns it back to the body. If a patient misses dialysis treatment, weakness and pulmonary edema can be the first series, a series of conditions that become progressively more serious from there. So some services transfer patients from dialysis centers. Um, you mentioned Northeast Ambulance, Tina. They probably still do dialysis transports. I think right. they do. People call it the renal roundup. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they're like, oh, another dialysis run. This is boring. You realize those are some of the sickest patients you're ever going to transport? The most thankful ones, too. The most thankful and also the most sick patients. Yeah. The sickest patients you're going to transport. Talk to them about their disease and learn. Okay? I'm not even kidding you guys. If you work for a transfer company, you get to take a dialysis patient. They are sick people. All right? Learn about them. A dialysis machine functions much like a normal kidneys do. All right? So patient undergoing long-term hemodialysis have a shunt that connects a vein and an artery, allowing blood to flow from the body to the dialysis machine. Peritoneal dialysis allows large amounts of dialysis fluid to be infused into the abdominal cavity. Uh, the fluid stays in the cavity for one to two hours, carries a high, this does carry a high risk for peritonitis. Um, adverse effects of dialysis, we hypotension, dysrhythmias, chest pain, muscle cramps, nausea and vomiting, hemorrhage from the access site and infection from the access site as well. So management will obviously be the ABCs. I don't like the whole X thing. It's airway breathing, circulation, blood bleeding, all that kind of stuff, but something new. Uh, provide high flow oxygen if needed. Manage any bleeding from the access site. Um, position the patient in a sitting up position in case of pulmonary edema or supine if the patient is in shock. Transport properly and some dialysis patients may also have urinary catheters, which also could be an a site of infection. Keep in mind, they also may have urinary catheters and do not just rip the patient out of a chair and toss them into the stretcher because you may pull the Foley catheter out. And that is painful when you pull a balloon that's inflated with 10 mLs of air through the urethra that's not big enough for that significant damage all right let's do some review questions where the answer is b but the blank lies retro in the retro peritoneal space b. <laughs> yes b i'm a little too fast on that one which of the following is not a solid organ Keyword not. D. Gobble out of D. Perfect.
a 34 year old woman with a recent history of pelvic inflammatory disease with those as PID presents with acute severe abdominal pain. Right? Her abdominum is abdominum. <laughs> her abdomen is distended and diffusely tender to palpation. Based on your findings thus far, you should suspect what? Sounds like a stethoscope out there. I'm gonna go with C appendicitis. I'm so gonna say a, I'm gonna say A. Pelvic inflammatory disease. Most commonly caused by a sexually transmitted disease, by the way. Like gonorrhea. Yeah. I'm gonna go with A. A it is peritonitis. Yeah. Right. The most patients with acute abdomen acute abdomen present with what? Most patients with an acute abdomen present with what? C. I go with D. D. Because of the pain. Pain, yes. Which of the following signs or symptoms would you least likely to find a, in a patient with acute abdomen? E word least. B. B. Least so likely. B. Awesome. Number six, a condition in which a person experiences a loss of appetite is called what? D. All right, anorexia. Good. Number seven, a medical term for inflammation in the urinary bladder is called what? A. 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 All right, because nephritis would be kidneys. Polycystitis is gallbladder, diverticulitis is diverticulum. Cystitis is UTI. Or inflammation of bladder. If a hernia is incarcerated, not in jail, right? And the contents are greatly compressed, that circulation is compromised, the hernia is said to be what? C. C. Yeah, it's regulated. Yep. A 70-year-old man presents with an acute onset of severe tearing abdominal pain that radiates to his back. Blood pressure is 88 over 66, pulse rate of 120, respiratory rate of 26. Treatment for this patient should be what? Yeah. You, guys, you guys already answered this with that question earlier. A. 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 Yeah, rapid transport. Get them to the hospital. It's probably a triple A. I don't have triple A. In which position do most patients get a hotel discount? Um, in which position do most patients with a dom acute abdominal pain prefer to be transported? On the silent knees. Like C. Yeah, C. Definitely. All right, I'm going to stop the recording and then we'll. Um, hey, real quick. It, it, was, uh, it was actually Potsy who sang it. That's what I meant. Uh, not, not Ralph. Ralph was the the uh, redheaded guy. Um, yeah. And if anybody wants to hear it, um, I'll play a little bit of it. Let me just stop recording really quick. Have you ever 